The chapter introduces Jacob, a new patient of the author doctor. Jacob seems anxious, but otherwise normal on the surface. The doctor describes her office space in detail, noting various gifts and decorations from past patients. This gives a sense of the intimate relationships formed there. However, boundaries prevent contact with patients outside the office. The space acts as a suspension from normal life, allowing for deep but temporary connections. This duality of intimacy within strict professional boundaries is challenging for therapists. The description establishes the author's perspective and approach to patients, as well as setting the scene for Jacob's upcoming appointment. Overall, it sets up the complex relationship dynamics and responsibilities involved in psychotherapy. The passage describes a psychotherapy session between the narrator, a therapist, and her patient, Jacob. Jacob explains that he developed a sexual addiction starting from a young age. He would masturbate frequently from ages 8 to 18, feeling intense shame, but unable to stop. As a teenager, he constructed a masturbation machine using a record player motor to stimulate himself for hours at a time, achieving intense pleasure but furthering his addiction. The narrator reflects on how Jacob's story illustrates how we can all develop addictions and unhealthy attachments to certain stimuli or behaviors, even if they seem extreme at first. She describes her own unhealthy attachment to romance novels and erotic fiction on her Kindle, which started innocently but escalated to the point of interfering with her personal and work life. The passage uses Jacob's story and the narrator's experience to show how modern technologies and certain media can enable addictive tendencies in all of us in subtle ways we may not recognize at first. The passage discusses how increased access to addictive substances is one of the biggest risk factors for addiction. Easy availability leads to higher rates of trying drugs and getting addicted. The opioid epidemic in the U.S. is used as an example where widespread prescription of opioids quadrupled exposure and risk of addiction. Similarly, prohibition in the U.S. saw reduced alcohol consumption and related harms when access was restricted. However, other factors also contribute to addiction risk, like genetics, trauma, mental illness, and social factors. Technological advances have increased access through mass production, variety, and potency of drugs. Things like cigarette machines, hypodermic syringes, and e-cigarettes have increased nicotine consumption and addiction. Cannabis and opioids are now much stronger. Modern, limbic capitalism and the drive for profits have contributed to overconsumption through persuasive marketing of highly processed foods and appealing drug formulations. Polypharmacy or multiple drug use is now common due to widespread availability and cultural acceptance. The patient went through 14 different drugs over a decade, starting with OxyContin and Xanax as a teenager, then exploring other opioids and drugs like ketamine and LSD through his 20s. He ended up addicted to heroin in his late 20s, early 30s. The author discusses how digital technologies have enabled new forms of addiction, like online pornography, gambling, and video games. The technologies themselves can be addictive due to their design with things like flashing lights and continuous rewards. The act of online consumption and buying products became an addiction for a patient who would order cheap goods just to return them right away to perpetuate the dopamine cycle of searching, ordering, and opening packages. Rates of behavioral addictions and drug addictions are rising globally due to increased accessibility enabled by technology and digital platforms spreading behaviors more contagiously. Things that may not have otherwise occurred to people can now spread widely online. A detective discussed a case where a young boy sexually abused his brother after watching sexually explicit cartoons online, something the detective had never seen before in his career due to increased access to such content. Global deaths from addiction have risen in all age groups between 1990 to 2017, with over half occurring in people under 50. Those most vulnerable to addiction issues tend to be the poor, undereducated, who have easy access to drugs, but lack meaningful opportunities and support systems. Studies show middle-aged white Americans without college degrees are dying younger due to drug overdoses, alcohol, liver disease, and suicide, called deaths of despair. Our overconsumption risks not just personal harm, but environmental damage, 
as natural resources diminish and emissions rise. The passage then introduces a patient named David, who was prescribed anxiety and ADHD medications in college, but ended up relying on and abusing them due to underlying issues not being addressed. It critiques modern notions that pursuing personal happiness and comfort should be the highest goal, rather than other conceptions of a good, meaningful life. Parenting approaches that try to prevent all childhood adversity or trauma risk creating children unable to cope with life's challenges. Modern society focuses heavily on psychological well-being and avoiding harm at the expense of building resilience. This links back to issues of addiction and deaths of despair. David and Kevin appear to have advantages in life, but struggle with debilitating anxiety, depression, and physical pain, unable to reach their potential. They seem to rely heavily on prescription drugs to cope. There has been a shift away from tolerating some degree of pain slash difficulty as healthy and toward eliminating all pain driven by a desire for a pain-free world. This has led to over-prescribing of medication. Rates of antidepressant, stimulant, and sedative use are rising globally, mirroring an inability to tolerate discomfort. In the U.S., enough opioids were prescribed for every person to have a bottle of pills. Younger generations struggle with boredom and avoid being alone with their thoughts by constantly plugging into devices for entertainment and distraction. This avoidance may exacerbate mental health issues. David attributes his issues to mental illness, but may have developed dependency and tolerance from misusing prescription stimulants, sedatives, and opioids for years to self-medicate and cope with normal life stresses and difficulties. His case illustrates some potential downsides of the trend toward over-medicating. The patient, David, was abusing prescription drugs including Adderall, Ambien, and Ativan to self-medicate and cope with stress and lack of self-care. He would get angry and yell at his wife when on too much Adderall. His drug use escalated over time and he began thinking about suicide. He realized he needed help when his wife became pregnant. David confessed everything to his wife and she took him to the emergency room in shock over the amount of pills he had been hiding and taking. He was admitted to the psychiatric ward for two weeks to detox and address his stimulant and sedative addiction as well as suicidal thoughts. He was discharged home after completing treatment. So in summary, the patient was self-medicating with prescription drugs to cope with stress and pain, but this escalated to the point of addiction, suicidal thoughts, and putting strain on his marriage. Realizing he needed serious help, he admitted himself to the hospital to detox and get treatment for his substance abuse and mental health issues. Repeated exposure to pleasure causes neuroadaptation, our enjoyment weakens, and we need more of something to feel the same pleasure. This is called tolerance. For addictive substances like opioids, prolonged heavy use leads to opioid-induced hyperalgesia, increased sensitivity to pain. It also causes a dopamine deficit state. Hedonism leads to anhedonia, inability to enjoy pleasure. Addiction ends with getting no high from the drug, but feeling miserable without it. Cues associated with drug use, like people, places, things can trigger craving via classical conditioning. Dopamine spikes in anticipation of reward, but dips below baseline if reward is not received, driving craving and drug seeking. Gambling disorder highlights how dopamine is released more due to unpredictable reward rather than final reward itself. Losing money causes a dopamine spike in pathological gamblers due to uncertainty. In summary, it outlines how repeated pleasure exposure leads to tolerance, increased pain sensitivity, and anhedonia in addiction due to changes in dopamine transmission and neuroadaptation. Cue conditioning also plays a role in craving via dopamine fluctuations with reward anticipation and delivery. Addiction experts and people in recovery have noted that there is a rush or dopamine hit from both winning and losing when gambling, which leads to loss-chasing behavior as people continue gambling to try and recreate that feeling. Social media apps may work in a similar way, where the unpredictability of getting likes slash comments creates a dopamine response from both receiving engagement as well as the uncertainty of whether engagement will be received. This drive for dopamine hits can be addicting. Drugs like cocaine physically alter the brain by changing dopamine neurons, making the pleasure pathway more sensitive over time, 
with repeated use in a process called sensitization. These changes can last a lifetime. Even after long periods of abstinence, a single exposure to an addictive drug can cause a person to slip back into compulsive use due to these persistent drug-induced brain changes. Natural rewards like learning and living in an enriched environment also increase dopamine firing in the brain. However, prior drug use like methamphetamine limits the brain's ability to form new connections from these natural rewards. While some addiction-induced changes may be permanent, recovery creates new neural pathways for healthy behaviors. The person uses a vaporizer pen and volcano vaporizer for consuming cannabis, sometimes uses edibles in between sessions or in emergencies when they can't smoke. They don't love edibles, but will use them situationally. The summary mentions various extraction and consumption methods like scissor hash, quiso wax, and a focus on vaporization over smoking. Overall, the passage indicates regular daily cannabis use through vaporization and occasional edible consumption without expressing a strong preference for edibles. Abstaining from smoking is only done in emergencies when vaporizing is not possible. The response rate summarizes the insights gained after abstaining from rewarding substances and behaviors for an extended period of time, typically four weeks. Younger people tend to recalibrate faster than older people. Physical withdrawal severity also varies by substance, from minor to potentially life-threatening. Trades one addiction for another are generally not effective long-term strategies. Any sufficiently rewarding substance or behavior risks becoming addictive. About 20% of patients don't feel better after abstaining, indicating the substance may not have been the main driver of underlying psychiatric issues requiring separate treatment. Even when beneficial, concurrent treatment of any co-occurring psychiatric disorders is important for good long-term outcomes. Mindfulness, or observing one's thoughts and emotions without judgment, is important for tolerating withdrawal symptoms and gaining insight during abstinence. Following abstinence, most patients report reduced anxiety, clearer thinking, and other benefits, gaining insight into how their substance was truly affecting them. At the end, patients consider whether to continue abstaining or return to using, but with the goal of healthier, less addictive patterns of use going forward. An ongoing debate in addiction medicine is whether people who are addicted can return to moderate controlled use of the substance rather than requiring total abstinence. Some emerging evidence and clinical experience suggests this is possible for some, especially with less severe addictions. However, aiming for moderation also carries risks, like an abstinence violation effect, where a period of abstinence is followed by a return to heavy use. This has been seen in animal studies. Even when moderation is achievable, many patients ultimately find abstinence easier long-term. For addictions to substances that can't be entirely avoided, like food, determining how to moderate consumption has become an important question. The author discusses different strategies people use to self-regulate and bind themselves, like creating physical, time-based, or meaning-based barriers between themselves and the addictive substance or behavior. While not foolproof, Self-binding is presented as a useful approach, especially given how accessible addictive substances and behaviors are in modern life. Oscar had a problem with drinking alcohol excessively. To prevent this, he had his wife lock any alcohol in their home in a locked file cabinet, with only she having the key. One day, Oscar's wife locked a bottle of wine in the file cabinet and left town. Oscar was curious about the locked bottle and tried various tools to try to open the locked drawer, but couldn't. He then used pliers to uncork the bottle through a small opening in the drawer. The story describes self-binding techniques like the K-Safe Kitchen Safe or medications like naltrexone that can impose locks at the cellular level to help with addiction. Naltrexone blocks opioid receptors to diminish rewarding effects of behaviors. Other addiction medications discussed include desulfiram, which causes negative side effects if alcohol is consumed while taking it, acting as a deterrent. Surgical procedures for weight loss, like gastric banding or bypass, can also act as forms of physical self-binding for addictions. So in summary, it discusses various physical and medical methods of self-binding or imposing barriers that can help treat addictions to substances like alcohol. 
Both Oscar's locked file cabinet and modern techniques like medications or surgery are presented as examples. The passage discusses various forms of self-binding or limiting one's own consumption of potentially addictive substances or activities. This includes physical measures like locks or surgeries, as well as chronological self-binding by restricting consumption to certain times or after milestones. Studies show rats, given unlimited access to drugs, escalate their use, while those with a one-hour window do not. Tracking time spent on addictive behaviors can help mitigate consumption by increasing awareness. However, consumption of addictive substances can distort perceptions of time and increase preference for immediate rewards over delayed ones. Leisure time has greatly increased in modern societies, leaving more opportunity for boredom and dopamine-seeking behaviors to fill the hours not spent working. Nelly briefly alluded to his own history of addiction. Years ago, a friend observed that his entire existence followed a three-part cycle. One, get fucked up. Two, fuck up. Three, damage control. The friend had witnessed Nellie's regular blackout drinking in the two months they had known each other. The friend hypothesized more generally that addicts are problem solvers who create situations to disentangle themselves from when no other challenges present, using drugs as a reward for success or consolation for failure. Nelly acknowledged this was an accurate assessment of his past addiction and self-perpetuating behavior at that time in his life. Chris became dependent on opioids after being prescribed painkillers for an injury in college. He struggled with addiction for many years, cycling through periods of use and recovery attempts. Buprenorphine Suboxone helped stabilize him and reduced his cravings, allowing him to function better. However, Buprenorphine is still an opioid and carries risks of misuse, diversion, and dependence. The doctor agreed to continue the prescription, but wanted to understand Chris's full history of addiction to determine the best ongoing treatment plan. Chris came from a difficult family background and struggled socially in college before his opioid dependence began, leaving him vulnerable to substance misuse. The doctor aimed to support his recovery in a balanced way while also mitigating risks related to the medication. Chris struggled with mental health issues and addiction. He attempted suicide after getting reprimanded for stalking a girl he was interested in. After several failed attempts to return to Stanford University due to his struggles, he discovered opioids, which initially made him feel connected but led to addiction. He bounced between Arkansas and Stanford over several years, trying and failing to complete his degree as his drug use escalated. He was eventually admitted to rehab and started on buprenorphine, Suboxone, which he credits with saving his life. After two years of stability on buprenorphine, he returned to Stanford and graduated with honors, going on to get a PhD. Years later, he has a wife and career, but chooses to remain on buprenorphine indefinitely to maintain his mental health and prevent a relapse into addiction. The medication allows him to have a stable life. The quote suggests that medications to address opioid addiction or treat mental health conditions can serve an important role by restoring balance to the brain's reward and pleasure systems. However, there are some potential downsides and concerns with long-term use of psychiatric medications. They may cause dependence or addiction over time. Stimulants like Adderall are addictive. Their efficacy is unclear, especially long-term. Mental health symptoms haven't decreased despite increased medication use. Some drugs may actually worsen symptoms. They could limit the ability to experience a full range of emotions. Some patients report feeling less human or disconnected from music art on medications. Their use may reflect societal failings rather than just individual chemical imbalances. Higher medication rates are seen in poorer communities. Long term, they could be a form of social control especially over disadvantaged groups who are medicated at higher rates. So while medications provide relief for some, their effects on human experience and as a widespread social phenomenon are complex issues with no simple answers. Both benefits and risks must be considered. The passage discusses how poverty and socioeconomic deprivation are associated with higher rates of psychiatric medication prescription and opioid prescription. 
those on Medicaid in particular are prescribed opioids and psychotropic drugs at higher rates. Even treatments for opioid addiction, like buprenorphine, may constitute a form of neglect if they are not accompanied by addressing the underlying social determinants of health and needs of economically disadvantaged patients. Medication alone is not enough for recovery. Pressing on the pain side through activities like cold water immersion can paradoxically lead to feelings of pleasure and well-being by elevating neurotransmitters like dopamine and norepinephrine. Cold water exposure has a long history of use therapeutically and is gaining popularity again among athletes and others for its perceived health benefits. So in summary, the passage discusses the link between poverty, deprivation, and higher medication rates, argues treatment must address social needs, and provides an example of how engaging with pain through cold exposure can elevate mood. Hormesis is the idea that low to moderate doses of stimuli that are otherwise harmful, e.g. pain, heat, radiation, can have beneficial effects by triggering adaptive stress responses in the body. Things like intermittent fasting, calorie restriction, and moderate exercise have been shown to extend lifespan in animals. Experiments on dogs found that repeated exposure to painful electric shocks resulted in a transition from fearful reactions to more relaxed behaviors and a fit of joy after the shocks. Heart rate changes also indicated relaxation after the initial stress response. This relates to the concept that pain leads to pleasure through homeostatic mechanisms in the body. Initial pain triggers reflexive physiological responses that result in feelings of pleasure. Repeated intermittent pain exposure shifts the body's hedonic set point towards pleasure over time. Exercise is temporarily toxic to cells, but has overwhelmingly positive long-term health effects. It increases mood-regulating neurotransmitters and reduces addiction risk. Mechanisms like dopamine release make exercise pleasurable and rewarding, motivating repeat activity. Moderate stimuli like exercise may provide hormetic benefits through stress response adaptations. Modern lifestyles involve much more sitting than in the past. On average, Americans now spend half their waking hours sitting, 50% more than 50 years ago. This sedentary lifestyle is detrimental given humans evolved to walk tens of kilometers per day. Exercise has a more profound and sustained positive effect on mood, anxiety, cognition, energy, and sleep than any pill. The author advises patients to walk for 30 minutes per day to reap benefits. Pursuing pain or discomfort goes against human instincts to seek pleasure and avoid pain. It takes effort to consciously pursue activities like exercise that cause initial discomfort. Exposure therapy is used to treat anxiety disorders like social anxiety. It involves gradually exposing patients to feared stimuli in a controlled way to desensitize them. For one patient, exposure involves small talk with coworkers and rating distress on a scale from 1100. Over time, exposure therapy helped reduce the patient's distress and fear. The key message is that moderate, regular physical activity through things like walking provides significant mental and physical health benefits compared to medications. While uncomfortable initially, consciously pursuing mildly painful or stressful activities through approaches like exposure therapy can help overcome fears and anxieties. The person was afraid to interact with others at work. Out of fear, they would be seen as crazy or get in trouble. They started challenging themselves to have small interactions with coworkers for a few minutes three times a day. Over weeks of doing this, it got easier. They then challenged themselves by making small talk with baristas at Starbucks, something they never would have done before due to fear. At first it went well, but they embarrassed themselves by spilling coffee. On the advice of their therapist, they purposefully spilled coffee the next time to get comfortable with embarrassment. Now they feel much less anxious in general, less on guard, and even enjoy meeting new people briefly. Their life is much different now thanks to facing their fears incrementally over time. Extreme sports like skydiving, canyon swinging, bungee jumping, and base jumping involve intense pain-fear combined with an adrenaline rush, creating a potent high. This can be addictive in the same way as drugs like cocaine. Repeated exposure to such painful, fearful experiences can reset the brain's tolerance level and increase the risk of anhedonia, lack of joy. 
Skydivers in one study showed higher rates of anhedonia. Technology has pushed the limits of what humans can endure, enabling extreme feats like ultramarathons in extreme conditions with extensive medical support monitoring and cold water swimming near Antarctica. Even activities seen as natural like free solo rock climbing require extensive rope training and preparation to master techniques and choreography. Success leads to fame and wealth, contributing to addictive potential. Overtraining syndrome can occur when endurance athletes train so much they stop feeling the rewarding endorphins from exercise, experiencing dysphoria instead. Exposure to too much potent pain increases risk of pain addiction, as seen in clinical cases of compulsive running self-harm. Conceptualizing as addiction and treating as such helped patients recover. Workaholism is celebrated but can be addictive due to incentive structures rewarding long hours. This divides work-home life and risks overconsumption to compensate for drudgery. Addictive flow state makes it hard to stop working. Pain exposure like cold water immersion is less risky if done in moderation and socially. It can provide life-affirming benefits by managing without destructive escapes like drugs, alcohol. Radical honesty also argued to be critically important for mental, physical health and well-being. Humans have an advanced ability to lie compared to other animals, which evolutionary biologists speculate developed due to our sophisticated language capabilities. More advanced language allows for more sophisticated deception. Lying can provide some adaptive advantages for competing for resources, but in a world of plenty, excessive lying risks isolation, craving, and overconsumption. Radical honesty, telling the truth about both large and small things, even when it exposes flaws or has consequences, is important for recovery from addiction and living a balanced life. Radical honesty promotes awareness of one's own actions. It fosters intimate relationships through transparency. It holds oneself accountable both to the present and future through an honest narrative of one's life. Telling the truth can also prevent future addiction issues. Awareness of behaviors, including those driven by automatic or unconscious urges, increases through openly discussing and recounting experiences. This gives more control over those behaviors. Various treatment approaches aim to strengthen connections in the brain related to this type of awareness. The prefrontal cortex, located in the forehead, is involved in decision-making, emotion regulation, planning, and complex cognitive processes. It is also key for storytelling. Researchers found that increasing neural activity in the prefrontal cortex through stimulation led people to be more honest in their responses. Their honesty could not be explained by self-interest or moral beliefs and was separate from factors like risk-taking and mood. This suggests honesty may be strengthened by activating the prefrontal cortex as the brain has mechanisms for controlling social behaviors. The writer wondered if regularly practicing honesty could also stimulate prefrontal cortex activity over time, similar to how other skills are strengthened through repeated use and neural wiring. A researcher responded, this is a reasonable intuition based on neural learning principles. Practicing radical honesty about one's own behaviors or qualities may strengthen the neural certs involved in honesty decision-making, and planning, just as practicing other skills does. This could help change behaviors by increasing awareness and control. So in summary, the passage discusses research showing honesty can be increased by prefrontal cortex stimulation and speculates that regularly being honest may also strengthen these brain regions over time through neuroplasticity effects. Telling truthful autobiographical narratives holds us accountable for our past actions and shapes our future behavior for the better. Victim narratives where one never accepts responsibility prevent healing. Psychotherapy should help patients tell more truthful, responsible stories. Alcoholics Anonymous emphasizes rigorous honesty and having members take responsibility for their flaws and mistakes through the 12 steps. This promotes transformation. The author found doing the 12 steps with his mentor helpful for overcoming resentment towards his mother by making him acknowledge how his own anxiety and demanding nature contributed to relationship issues, not just her faults. This lifted his burden of anger and improved their relationship. Telling truthful stories about ourselves makes us more authentic, free, and responsible for both past and future. 
It moves us away from hiding behind a false self and toward real understanding and growth. The key idea is that truthful autobiographical narratives that involve accepting responsibility, not just focusing on victimhood, promote mental health, accountability, insight, authenticity, and ultimately better relationships. The 12 steps are given as an effective method for achieving this. Donald Winnicott postulated that people can develop a false self as a constructed persona to defend against intolerable external demands and stressors. This can lead to feelings of profound emptiness. Social media encourages people to curate exaggerated and unrealistic narratives of their lives that diverge greatly from reality. This can contribute to feelings of derealization and depersonalization when one's actual lived experience does not match their online persona. The antidote is developing an authentic self through radical honesty. This grounds us in reality, lessens the cognitive load of maintaining false narratives, and allows for more openness and connection with oneself and others. Truth-telling and reliability can foster a plenty mindset where people feel confident in the predictability and safety of the world. Lying breeds a scarcity mindset of competitive survivalism and short-term thinking. Even with material abundance, excessive dopamine from social media or post-truth politics can induce feeling of scarcity. Conversely, finding meaning through connections and external causes can give a plenty mindset amid material lack. Radical honesty and transparency, such as admitting to past issues like a DUI up front, is presented as a form of prevention that allows for open evaluation and support to maintain well-being and fitness to practice as a physician. Drake was a medical student who got a DUI after drinking and driving home from a party. A friend advised him to get a lawyer and plead not guilty to avoid a DUI on his record. He paid the lawyer $5,000. On the day in court, when the judge asked for his plea, Drake hesitated but then pleaded guilty, despite his lawyer advising him to plead not guilty. The judge was surprised by his guilty plea. Drake's honesty resulted in fines, classes, and disclosing the DUI on applications, but his lawyer refunded the $5,000. Drake believes his honesty that day may have put him on a better path compared to if he had lied. His father had taught him the importance of honesty as a child. He now rarely drinks himself due to his risk-taking nature. Telling the truth helped him feel more comfortable with himself without secrets. His story convinced the author that emphasizing honesty is important to teach children. Though the outcomes could be different for those of lower socioeconomic status or minorities. In general, the patients have taught the author that honesty enhances self-awareness, relationships, and accountability to one's narrative and values. Lori grew up in a strict religious household where she felt unworthy and inadequate. She struggled with anxiety, low self-esteem, and feelings of not belonging. She was an athletic teenager, but broke her ankle, ending her aspirations of competing in track. She turned to overeating for comfort and started experimenting with drugs in her late teens, early 20s. Over many years, she cycled through towns, jobs, and relationships while using food, pills, alcohol, and cannabis to cope with emotional pain. She engaged in binge eating, medication misuse, and risk-taking behaviors. By her mid-30s, she was living alone, spending free time getting intoxicated and listening to conspiracy theories. She showed signs of paranoia and stored large amounts of gasoline, contemplating suicide. She recognized needing help, but was afraid to admit flaws due to fear of rejection, as her church discouraged sharing problems. She weighed nearly 250 pounds and felt deeply depressed. So in summary, Lori had a troubled upbringing, turning to substance misuse as a young adult to self-medicate emotional issues. This escalated over years into dangerous behaviors and weight gain, though she realized needing help while fearing stigma prevented her from seeking it. Here are the key points this passage makes about OHAL, or prescription pills addiction. One enduring problem with addiction to substances like pills is compulsive, self-destructive overconsumption. This characterization is generally fair. Addiction involves losing control over one's consumption in a way that becomes self-destructive. Getting treatment and support can help address the underlying issues that lead to compulsive consumption, like shame, lack of community, secrecy, etc. 
but simply losing weight or attending church may not be enough if those environments do not adequately support the person in recovery. Destructive shame, where addiction leads to isolation and further consumption, is perpetuated when communities shun those struggling or push them to hide their issues. This was seen with Lori's experience opening up to church elders. Recovery models like AA use prosocial shame more effectively by creating a caring community where people can be honest about struggles without fear of rejection. Accountability is coupled with acceptance and support, allowing people to address their issues openly. Prosocial shame orients the person towards specific actions to make amends, like the 12 steps, rather than just feeling bad. This provides a path forward that discourages further destructive behaviors. So in summary, compulsive overconsumption is a fair characterization of addiction, and treatment needs to address the underlying psychological and social factors that drive and perpetuate the addiction cycle, like shame, secrecy, and lack of community support. Recovery models show how prosocial shame handled correctly can help overcome addiction, whereas destructive shame often makes the problem worse. The theory of sacrifice and stigma posits that religious and social groups demand costly commitments from members to reduce free riding. Behaviors like strict dress codes, food restrictions, or technology abstention seem irrational, but function to filter out those not dedicated to the group. Strict adherence to rules in groups like AA and 12-step programs serves to maintain club goods like accountability and social support networks crucial for recovery. Demanding full confessions of relapses and resetting of sobriety dates guards against backsliding. While seemingly extreme, these practices strengthen member ties to prioritize the group's well-being over any individual. Incorporating principles of prosocial shame into parenting can build honesty and empathy. By openly admitting mistakes and making amends, parents model accepting imperfections. Validating children's strengths and weaknesses through honest feedback supports accurate self-assessment without damaging self-esteem. Radical honesty within the family creates space for openness, while cultivating virtue. Sacrifice and stigma can be used to strengthen family bonds and group identity. The swim coach uses various rules and standards to foster participation and discourage free riding. While strict, the kids seem to enjoy belonging to the tight-knit team. Shame can have positive social functions if used pro-socially. Moderate shame keeps narcissism in check and connects people to their support networks. However, shame is also associated with bullying and social media cancel culture. Both the author and her patient Muhammad found recovery from addiction and compulsive behavior by immersing themselves in meaningful activities like patient care and nature photography rather than seeking escape. Facing their issues head-on through engaging work helped reset their brain's reward pathways. Balance is key. The relentless pursuit of pleasure leads to pain, while recovery involves both abstinence to reset the brain and finding joy in simpler things once more. Radical honesty, prosocial shame, and confronting issues directly rather than escaping can promote health. Small daily healthy practices accumulate over time like Dumbledore lighting lamps. One only sees the progress illuminated from a distance. Maintaining balance requires patience and ongoing effort.